それではこれから後半の発表セッション日本文化の表彰を始めます前半と同様まず国際交流基金の担当者より登壇者の紹介を行いその後発表に移りますそれでは一人目の発表者を国際交流基金担当者よりご紹介いたしますはい。Uh, literature and animal representations with a stress on the theme of death and sexuality.、Uh, a sp- uh, Professor Tanev, being a specialist of con- comparative literature and speaking several languages,、uh, his research encompasses those writers, East and the West, modern and classic. Such as Edgar Allan Poe, Hagihara Saktaro, Terayama Shuji, Murasaki Shikibu, Emil Zola, Colette, Wilke, James Joyce, T.S. Eliot, Kafka, Natsume Soseki, Tanizaki Junichiro, Kaji Motojiro, Uchida Hyakken, Takahama Kyoshi, Tsutsui Yastaka, and others. では、えー、テナブ先生よろしくお願いします。Hello, had we but world enough and time, as Andrew Marvel says, I would have told you the long and marvelous story of the cat in Japanese literature. Since the Heian period, with its aristocratic cats, through the extraordinary supernatural cats of the Edo period. To the remarkable and amusing nameless cat of Natsume Soseki's I Am a Cat, right to the present day cats of Murakami Haruki, Hosaka Kazushi, or Kawamoto Genki. We don't have the time. We human beings are finite creatures, so I will be brief and I'll just try to make a point. In a poem、uh, by Hagiwara Sakutaro called China Pink, And Blue Cat, published in 1923, there is a lonely cat playing with the corpse of a beautiful dead girl. In another poem, written five years later, titled Corpse of a Cat, there is a corpse of a cat and a beautiful ghost of a girl, Ula, who has to bury it. There are other works, like the famous poem Blue Cat, where the cat is a shadow and a phantom who dreams. These poems are specific for Sakutaro's writing, but at the same time, they are representative of the place cats in Japanese literature occupy a place between dream and reality, between life and death, between man and woman, between the visible and the invisible, between language and silence. In Heian literature, cats turn up in the dreams of the protagonists, premonitions to warn them or give them a sign of a pregnancy or imminent death. Or to say that they are noble women reborn in a cat form. In medieval literature and during the Edo period, cats become bakineko and nekomata, supernatural beings with two tails who can dance and talk like humans after having lived for 10 years and can turn into humans like tanuki. In Edo, cats come to take away the corpse of the dead, kill the people who take care of them. And get very often killed at the first sign of supernatural behavior. In modern literature, the death of a cat and its corpse are a topic incessantly taken up and explored by writers and poets alike. One can find it in Atsume Soseki, in Takakama Kyoshi, Arishima Ikuma, Tokutomi Roka, and so on, just like the topic of cat dreams and cats that are dreaming. Um, in Hagiwara Sakutaro, Chida Hyakken, Sato Haruo, Kawabati Asunari, and so on and so forth. 
And just as the death of the cat is described again and again, the cats seem to refuse to die. They return as ghosts or survive 100 deaths. I will give you but one example with the most famous cat in Japanese literature, Soseki's nameless cat from I Am A Cat. At the end of the novel, the cat supposedly dies, but it resuscitates in Uchida Hyakken's novel, I Am A Cat, the fake version. And from there, it kept on walking as if immortal from book to book, giving rise to works like Takada Hiroshi's I Am Also A Cat, Wagahai Wa Neku Demo Aru, or to the collection I Am A Cat Too, Wagahai Mo Neku Deru, and so on and so forth. The title of Sano Yoko's celebrated children's book, The Cat That Lived a Million Times, is telling, and it is not by chance that it has inspired many stories in its turn. Not unlike the cat in some of the poems of Tereyama Shuji, the cat in Japanese literature is perhaps made of smoke, kemuri. Boku no neko wa kemuri de dekitiru, dakara tokidoki boku no beddo de kiete shimao. My cat is made of smoke, that's why sometimes lying on my bed it vanishes. Or from a different poem, kemuri to you na no koneko ga shinimashita, oshiro no niwa ni umemashita, na ane mae no fuyu deshita. The kitten called smoke died. I buried it in the castle's garden. It was seven years ago in the winter. Smoke eyeballs of the cute kitten come with me when I become a bride. The cat in literature is as if made of smoke. It is there and not there, visible and invisible. It is a girl when it is not a girl, a boy and not a boy. It lives, it dies, it survives its own death, living on as a metaphor, as a metonymy, as an allegory, or simply as a cat, if that is possible at all. And here I come to my point. The cat, or rather the way Japanese writers represent the cat, suggests that the cat is a figure of what crosses borders, and thus what puts boundaries and limits in question. This tells us perhaps something about the culture more than it tells us about cats. And as boundary crossing, the figure of the cat is a figure of the human beings attempting to transcend their own finitude. A figure of this finitude in its impossible transcendence and therefore a figuration of the contact with our others. The figure of the cat is an other. It is the other animal, but as a human fantasy. The other within, as it were. Simultaneously, they represent the other sex. They are girls for the boys and vice versa. Cats in literature, are they truly other or are they just a representation of the impossible desire to transcend one's own finitude? Or perhaps the figure of the cat is not simply a representation, but the point where the boundaries actually are crossed. It lets us see what is forbidden to look at, like the noble intendant Kashiwagi glimpsing at the third princess on a sanomia after a cat playing has lifted the blinds in the Wakana chapter of the tale of Genji. It lets us glimpse at what is impossible to see, the future or what is beyond death. At the same time, we do not know what the cat itself sees, what dreams it sees in the words of Sakutaro. And we presume that able to see in the dark, the cat can see everything. Nandemo mieru no daro, as Hyakken says in Kare wa neko de at my back, I hear time's winged chariot herring near. And I have to conclude, we humans are finite beings. The figure of the cat functions as a way to deal with this finitude, to imagine it from the outside, from the side of the infinite. Cats can be so small and immensely big, yet they are never simply finite, living on after their own death, or surviving in dreams and memories. And they are not infinite, they can and do die. Neither finite nor infinite, they figure the in-between and cross borders and boundaries. The cat is figurated and configured not as being in dreams and not as being in reality, but as being in dreams and reality, living and dead, between life and death. It is more than we do and is itself almost invisible. It vanishes like smoke, only to return again and again, a figure of desire, a phantom, a phantasm forever walking on the border. Thank you for your attention.
発表ありがとうございましたそれでは次の登壇者を国際交流基金担当者からご紹介いたします、はい、では私から次のご発表いただきますエリック船橋さんをご紹介いたしますブラジルご出身の彼は現在カンザス大学に在籍中,在籍中ですお名前からわかる通り日系ブラジル人の方です現在は慶応義塾大学で研究をされています彼の研究は日本の明治時代の料理本に当時の女性への潜在的な教育を多角的な観点から見出すというものです私は多くのフェロー等を接してまいりましたが料理本に当時の教育と社会背景の連関をあぶり出す彼の研究は大変興味深いと考えております。日本語も大変堪能な彼なのですが、何事にも全力投球の彼は、本日もできるだけたくさんのことをお伝えしたいということで、英語でプレゼンテーションをいただきます。さて、彼はまた主流深く自分に大変厳しい方なのですが、なんとブラジル人なのに夏が嫌いと。かつカンザスの冬も好きじゃないというエリック船橋さんですよろしくお願いしますそうですカンザスの冬は超寒いです<笑>、uh, So、uh, I'm gonna present about my dissertation project today my PhD dissertation、um, I, I would explain later I didn't do many、uh, deep analysis yet but as far as I could get now Uh, I think it's already interesting. So, a short explanation about what was happening in the Meiji period.、Um, the government created new policies aimed to limit women's activity in society, and as a result, women were forbade to vote and engage in social associations. But perhaps most importantly,、uh, the government wanted to propagate the idea that women's duties at home w a s How they could contribute to the growing of the nation. And perhaps one of the most、uh, famous ideologies that circulated at that time was the Irosai Kembo. But it's not that the government freely propagated these ideas,、uh, the main tool that they used for、uh, propagating these ideas was the education system. And the government adopted. The American model, American education system as a model, because the American model emphasized household duties as a main topic for women's education. And so the Meiji government reformed women's education based on the American model to make household duties such as cooking, sewing, and child raising as、uh, the main topic of women's education. So, women's education had four mandatory years that taught them how to basically read and write. But middle and higher levels of education were basically focused on household duties, but higher levels of education were very expensive and therefore not、uh, women from all social classes could afford attending school.、Um, to give this, provide this. Women with a lower level of education with an opportunity to study、uh, cookbooks and other household guides were published in increasing numbers. And we can identify similarities between、um, cookbooks and food education textbooks. So, but they were both related to providing education, one formally at schools, and another is informal. When we can see also in the authorship that、uh, most of the authors belong to the education field. And among male, there were many professional chefs who also authored cookbooks and、um, textbooks from school. So, but two main points are very important here is the differences because food education. Textbooks were controlled by the government through the education system, but cookbooks were not. 
and also cookbooks allowed women to debut as authors, which was the first for the first time that occurred in the Meiji period, uh, which also gave women an uh, opportunity to create a new career as well. So I've been working with this cook, Meiji period cookbooks for the past few months, and some things that I noticed that I um, that I think is very worth paying attention be, uh, regarding this pedagogical nature of these cookbooks is that authors made changes in the written language to facilitate the comprehension. Um, so, well, first, the furigana was not equivalent to the kanji, but furigana itself is already a resource to facilitate the comprehension because not all books had furigana before, but some authors decided to choose a different wording or a different use for furigana. So for example, when you had the kanji shokuhin, when you read the furigana, the furigana is written kuimono. The meaning is nearly the same, um, likely, um, but they are, not, uh, they are not equivalent. So that furigana is not really telling the reader how to read the kanji, but it's telling the reader the meaning of the word in a different sense. And some authors uh, use the writing style that emulated a spoken language. So they are very clear that the way you should read these books was out loud, and that will be like if someone was talking to you. So um, they change, especially the particle wa, that from, for someone with a lower level education, you can miss, read that as ha. So instead of like watashi ha, uh, to avoid that risk, they change all particles to the other wa. And um, well, if, they, if that facilitated comprehension in the Meiji period, that makes it difficult for us now. And another point that I want to highlight is that Authors included other topics than just recipes in cookbooks. They were very concerned about etiquette or table manners, especially on books talking, focused on uh, Western cuisine. Um, there are many books folks, uh, that with lessons on house management or how to train servants during a dinner or when you're receiving gas, which suggests that the, um, some of these cookbooks were aimed for higher social classes because not everybody could hire servants at that time. And one of the last books that I read um, had half of the book written in English, although the author is a Japanese woman. Um, she said that she included English among the recipes, so recipes in both languages, to let readers practice English that they have learned before, to the point that they would be able to get used to the terminology and in the future fully read uh, cookbooks only in English. So they wanted, the, she wanted to allow the readers to practice and sometimes and to learn because they had a, a terminology of cooking words at the back of the book. And that wraps up my presentation, and thank you very much. ありがとうございました。それでは次に東京大学の赤川学先生よりコメントを頂戴したいと思います。よろしくお願いいたします。Is it okay? Nice to see you, everyone. I'm Manabu Akagawa. I specialize in sociology and sexual history of modern Japan
I have a re I have been interested in the topic for over 20 years, but now I decided to start another topic, cat, cat sociology, sociology of cats. <laughs> so I'm very happy to co uh, have uh, have opportunity to comment on you on you on, on your presentations. Uh, first of all, uh, from a sociological, uh, 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 I'd like to uh, let let me give you uh, give uh, one comment on Professor Darwin's presentation. Uh, from a sociological point of view, modern society can be characterized as the time when the relationship between cats and humans have become deepest. In modern Japan, there are more cats than dogs and even more than human children under the age of 15. So now, cats are loved as family members or as a cute, cute being, cute or lovely or kawaii being, more than human beings. And the cat boom is occurring now, you know. On the other hand, a human feelings and collective mentality towards cats are historically constructed and it is well known that they were afraid and repelled as ghost cats, bakeneko, before modern times. Darling, uh, your research today uh, investigates the historical changes in the position of cats in Japanese literature. And uh, you find that during the Heian period, cats were referred to as a premonition of pregnancy or death in the tale of Genji, Genji Monogatari, or the reverse of aristocrats in Sarashinaneki. And in the Edo period, cat was depicted as a ghost cat, a bakeneko or a nekomata. And in modern times, it, it, it is depicted as, as an animal crossing the border between life and death or uh, between what is visible and what is invisible. And this seems to be a perfect grasp of the charm or and or horror, horror of cats, which is behind or against the modern mentality, the thinking of cats as a human family members. So in this presentation, you mentioned the work of many, ah, uh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, so, sorry, uh, you mentioned the work of many famous writers, Soseki Natsume, uh, Hagiwara Sakutaro, Terayama Shuji. I like them too. Uh, on the other hand, from a sociological point of view, the ex expression uh, or re representation in literature is very unique and original to the writers. So it is difficult to determine how much it reflects the values and the collective spirit of society. However, I think that by comparing not only literature, but also essays, newspapers, magazines, television programs, movies, and other discourses, it would be possible to judge the pop popularities or uniqueness of the author's discourse. I believe it. Of course, literature is not exactly the same as people's personal feelings and collective mentality in society, but it is clear that literature and society uh, interact each other, so it reflects each other. So I sincerely hope that your liter literacy research and my cat sociology can collaborate in the near future. <laughs> And second, let me give some brief comment on Professor Eric's presentation. Uh, you, your research investigates the hegemonic ideology that controls women's social participation, which was generally called good wife, wise motherhood, Ryosai Kenboshogi, in Meiji era domestic cookbooks. Uh, I feel that it, 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 it follows the method of cultural studies or critical discourse analysis in sociology. In particular, it is, I, feel, I feel really important to point out that 
cookbooks functioned as a discourse that controls women who could not afford to be uh, who could not afford to be educated. And your research also focuses on the social background, class, gender uh, of cookbook authors. The authors, especially if they are women, were educators and at the same time made their debut as a professional writers. Uh, this, is, this is really important, uh, interesting for me, because that could have been useful for their career development despite their limited opportunities for social participation. And personally, I found one point really interesting. The point is that American education system was used in the world of cookbooks, which was quite in contrast to medicine in Meiji era. Maybe, maybe uh, you know much about the medicine in, in Meiji era. And many books on medicine were also written in English at the beginning of Meiji era. But when national medical education was developed among higher education, its language was switched to German, Deutschgo. Uh, and I, I'm not sure if the British and American uh, books influenced, uh, 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 its influence continued in the world of comic books. Uh, I wonder why it is the, ca why it is the case. From the perspective of Western cuisine and Japanese culture, I think this is an interesting issue. Anyway, I am looking forward to the future development you research. So I have to leave at 4.20. So, so please give me brief answers. Thank you very much. それではただいま発表いただいたお二人からもコメントを頂戴できればと思います。長川先生、thank you very much for for this comment.、Um, uh, it's it's really interesting to 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 think of、uh, uh, the representation of cats in literature and of a possible sociology of the place cats occupy in society. Uh, uh, so so、um, I, I don't know.、Uh, I'm, my research is uh, uh, focused on literature, so uh, uh, what, I, what I found was a certain configuration, configuration of cats with death and, and sexuality and boundary crossing.、Um, and it was like this for a very long time.、Um, it was like this ever since, since Heian. And in Heian,、um, already the cat. Was a beloved animal for, for certain aristocrats. And、uh, Kashiwagi, the nobleman、uh, who falls in love with、uh, Onna Sanomiya,、uh, actually uh, takes the kitten and、uh, starts, starts taking care of it and, and sleeps with it and、uh, writes poems about it and, and, and so on. So it was like a, a, a family member, <laughs> actually. Um, at the same time, even, even now,、uh, people love scary tales about cats. And, and this is a part of contemporary literature that is t popular literature. It's not Junbo n Gaku, but it's still uh, very, uh, telling that, that、uh, these books、uh, sell in、uh, tens, and thousands, uh, tens of thousands of, of copies. So,、um, yeah, but I'm looking for, a, for the collaboration as well.、Uh, The sociological perspective will open up a, a very different way to look at、um, all these texts I'm analyzing. Thank you very much. Akagao、uh, Sensei, thank you very much for your comments.、Um, yeah, when you, when, you, when you mentioned that. As、that cookbook as a discourse too.、Uh, I, the thing that comes to my mind is that so if the cookbook is a discourse too, is so recipes and 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 food can be used as a, as ideological tool as well.、Uh, so that <laughs> it's keeping my mind busy now. Sorry.、Um, I'm glad that you mentioned the, like the medicine uh, uh, the use of medicine because 
it's the discourse on cookbooks when they refer to Western cuisine is f fully related to modernity. So something that Japanese need to learn because that's the that's what the world was wanting to learn at that time. So we, we should, Japanese should follow uh, uh, that wave on, on learning about Western cuisine. So maybe, and that's a big maybe for me, that regardless of the possibility or the availability of ingredients, the possibility of preparing Western food or not, being in contact with uh, these cookbooks, cooking techniques, and ingredients was already kind of a sign of achieving modernity that uh, the government wanted at the time. So we, even though it's not ideal what they were expecting from uh, these cookbooks, it's a necessity at the time that was being fulfilled. But again, this is um, just my brain thinking now, and, and I need to uh, <laughs> and organize these ideas. And I, I'm, I'm very happy that you brought this up. Thank you very much. ありがとうございました。それでは最後のお三方の発表へと進めさせていただきます。次の登壇者を国際交流基金担当者よりご紹介いたします。はい、では続いての登壇者、え、風礼さんについてご紹介させていただきます。風さんは、え、中国暗記症のご出身でして、現在、え、米国ワシントン大学セントルイスの博士課程にございせきされています。え、そして今回、え、早稲田大学にて
My dissertation project complements the field of modern Japanese literature and literary sound studies. The few studies in English have looked at the connections between music and modern or contemporary Japanese literature. Japanese scholarships read music referenced in their literary texts as reflections of the author's aesthetic taste and their knowledge of the cultural history of music in Japan. They overlook the emotive quality of these references and the ways how sounds of idol music and musical performances construct imaginary worlds of the past in the face of what is lost in modernity. The building on connections among literary analysis, music aesthetics, and historical contextualization. My PhD dissertation approaches the literary text from an interdisciplinary angle. So I examine the narrative function of sound concealed in the written descriptions of lyrics, melodies, singing, and hearing. I also analyze the connections between literary references to idol music and musical performances and the socio-political condition of Tokyo before the Pacific War. Finally, through references to sheet music, historical recordings, and films, I discuss how idol music functions as an emotional trigger for characters to express their ardent longing for an imagined, personalized, lost idol. So my dissertation project has three analytical chapters. My first chapter examines Nagai Kafu's Kagawa no Ta and Sumidagawa. Both works were published in 1909, one year after Kafu returned to Japan from France. Fukagawa no Uta makes references to the Utazawa Ballet, while the Sumidagawa makes references to the Kiyomoto Ballet and far more significantly, music of the Kabuki Theater. I note that the idol songs referenced are melancholic music about the forbidden love of professional women from the licensed quarters. They sing their strong desires for the freedom of love, which to them is now certainly allowed. The licensed quarter woman's outcry for love, I argue, symbolizes Kafu's will to power. A desire to possess melancholy by transforming it into his spiritual power and use that power to create an idealized artwork in literary writing that stimulates his melancholic state of mind. I note that in Kafu's vision, this type of woman is an aesthetic representation of the lost adult past. Kafu's male protagonist, while in search of this past, finds himself in an endless loop of melancholy in which he forever longs for her hopelessly. Melancholic idol music expresses the male protagonist's desire to immerse himself in his nostalgia for his idol past. They express his longing for his lost idol and guide him to be closer to the illusion of the woman he longs for. He is forever trapped in a web of melancholy created by himself. Connections between the self and sound and space show that audio representations in the text stimulate the protagonist's nostalgia and longing and hence exacerbates his melancholy. My second analytical chapter examines references to children's songs in Izumi Kyoko's Kusameku. Written during Kyoko's stay at Zushi, Kanagawa Prefecture, Kusameku makes references to old Maliuta and Walabeuta. These songs are framed as children's songs, inappropriate, inappropriate for children to sing and yet enchanting to them in the story. The dark and sad songs function as a medium of suffering and pain. They unveil Kyoko's aesthetic approach to literature as an artwork of human emotion. Music expresses the suffering of Kyoko's female monsters. Um, <laughs> yeah. Every song sings the, tragedy, sings the tragic story of Kyoka's beautiful heroine who longed for love, suffered in pain, and died in agony. Her pain turns her into a monster in the afterlife, whose emotional pain invoked by music infects anyone who hears it. Once infected, the listeners experience her intensive emotional pain and gets absorbed in the world of the dead. So our children's songs mentioned in the story have their references in the adult period. Nonetheless, they are edited and adapted by Kyoka. Though the action of adapting, editing, and rewriting, I argue, 
on views Kyoka's authorial power over the cultural materials that he chooses to use in framing his aesthetic fictional world, which I note is intimately connected to his personal memory of his childhood and his past, opposed to the modern collective memory of the Meiji Japan. So in our way, music functions like more or less like the cat, like in <laughs> the previous presentations. Like it's a, it's like it's a medium that connect that connects different worlds. It's a medium. It's like that dwells on the borders. So, and my last analytical chapter analyzes references to adult music in Tanizaki Jinichiro's Tadeku Mushi. So I argue for the cinematic effects concealed in the novel's written narrative. So Tadeku Mushi makes numerous references to music and musical performances of the Edo period, especially Juta and music of the puppet theater. I show that Tanizaki's depiction of musical sounds is influenced by his experience in filmmaking, which he wrote about in his essays published during the 1910s and 1920s. In the novel, the sound of Edo music interrupts the passage of time. Sounds invoke flashback scenes in which the main character, while reminiscing of his childhood past, overlapping that past with his present imagination of the plebeian culture of the old Edo. Old Edo. Tadeku Mushi has largely been received as Tanizaki's rediscovery of the beauty of traditional Japan after he moved to Kansai after the Great Kanto earthquake in 1923. However, I show in my analysis that this rediscovery can also be read as Tanizaki's reimagination and the recreation of Japan's aesthetic past. So, ご発表ありがとうございました。それでは次の発表者を紹介いたします。はい、では続いての登壇者ジャネットボーランド先生についてご紹介させていただきます。ボーランド先生は2008年にメルボルン大学にて日本研究の博士号を取得後。2009年から香港大学にて研究教育に取り組まれてきました。そして現在、東京大学東洋文化研究所にて訪日研究を行っていらっしゃいます。先生が今回研究対象にされているのは日本人にとっては昔話で馴染みがある単調ズルです。単調
11 of the 15 are threatened with extinction, making them one of the most endangered families of birds in the world. Two separate populations of red-crowned cranes exist in Northeast Asia. The first, shown in the map here, is a non-migratory resident population in Hokkaido. And the second is a migratory continental population which breeds in the Amur River Basin of China and Russia and winters in the DMZ and China's coastal wetlands. While this continental population has declined due to habitat loss and other factors, the Japanese population has steadily increased. So much so, in fact, that last year the organisation responsible for monitoring the global risk of extinction reclassified the red-crowned crane from endangered to vulnerable, and it was quite controversial. The Kushiro wetland is Japan's most important breeding ground for red-crowned cranes. After raising their chicks here in the summer, the cranes winter 20 kilometres west of the wetland, where the unfrozen rivers provide a safe place to roost at night. These fields, pictured here near the town of Akan, are a magical place to see cranes, and my memorable visit in 2016 was the inspiration for my research. Today, Hokkaido is home to a population of around 1,500 cranes, but 70 years ago, extinction was a very likely scenario. Can you imagine what Japan would look like without the red-crowned crane? Today, I pose this to you as a hypothetical question, but in 1946, there were only about 30 cranes left in Hokkaido. My larger book project covers the 20th century and is entitled Endangered Icon, Japan's Quest to Save the Red-Crowned Crane from Extinction. As a Japan Foundation Fellow, my project On the Brink of Extinction focuses on the pre-war period. My key research question is what environmental, political, social and cultural factors contributed to the near extinction of the crane by 1946? And over the last four months, the questions I've focused on are first, what was known about cranes in pre-war Japan in terms of their ecology and population and how accurate was that knowledge? Second, where could cranes be found both in Japan and overseas? And third, what kind of materials and historical documents were published on cranes and who was writing about cranes? As the title of my presentation today suggests, I've uncovered evidence of cranes in some strange places, not only in the archives, but also literally in strange places far away from their natural habitat in Hokkaido. I'd now like to take you on a brief journey of my discoveries. Not surprisingly, I found information by Japan's leading zoologists and ornithologists, such as this 1898 volume by Tokyo Imperial University Professor Ijima Isao. The content is brief and mostly describes the crane's appearance. Ijima also writes that the bird originally migrated to northeastern Japan in large numbers. Cranes appear in the 1921 children's picture book by biologist Ishikawa Chiyomatsu and children's author Fujisawa Morihiko. Interestingly, they list the crane's place of residence, Genseki, as eastern Siberia, not Hokkaido. In addition to ornithologists and children's books, I also found fascinating material by Nihonga artists. Of course, paintings of cranes such as these often featured in exhibitions. Last week, I discovered this book published by photographer Okamura Toyo. His photos of cranes in Kyoto Zoo were actually designed to serve as models for artists. Even more exciting, I found these records by Uenoyama Kiyotsugu, who actually travelled to Hokkaido in 1936. His first-hand accounts of painting cranes in the wild are fascinating, and as I'll explain shortly, extremely rare. As I continued my research, I kept finding evidence of cranes outside of Hokkaido in some strange places. I found cranes in gardens as far south as Kumamoto, Korakuen, Miyajima and Hiroshima in the private garden of the Asano family, as well as Osaka, Kobe, Kyoto and Shiogama in Miyagi. And closer to Tokyo, cranes were in Kawasaki and of course the Ueno Zoo. Earlier this week, 
I found, finally found photographic evidence, a bit too late to go into my PowerPoint, but photographic evidence of cranes in the home of Okuma Shigenobu of Waseda. The emperor presented a pair of cranes to Okuma in 1917 to celebrate his 80th birthday and are pictured in this album. The most surprising evidence of cranes in strange places, however, appeared while I was searching the Tokyo Asahi newspapers. In 1935, Japan sent cranes to Hawaii and Australia. I immediately thought of so many questions. Why, how, what gifts or animals did these countries send back to Japan in return? Most importantly, where did all these cranes come from? It's possible that some were bred in zoos, but this doesn't account for the significant numbers. So my original hypothesis was that the cranes found in cities ranging from Honolulu and Sydney to Kyoto and Kumamoto were coming from Hokkaido and therefore depleting the wild population. Two recent discoveries, however, have challenged my hypothesis. First, it appears that Japan's crane population was relatively stable between 1926 and 1946, with numbers around 20 to 40. In 1932, the Ministry of Education published this survey of natural monuments, Tennen Kinenbutsu. Kuzu Seichi, a bird expert from the Ministry of Agriculture and Commerce, wrote a detailed chapter about the breeding grounds of the red-crowned crane in Kushiro. Second, I have increasingly found evidence that the cranes used as gifts and to stock private gardens and zoos were coming from Korea. In this 1936 article, the Tokyo Asahi reported that the Ueno Zoo did not have any suitable birds to send to Sydney, so the Ministry of Foreign Affairs requested that cranes be sent from Korea. Returning to my original question after four months of research, I've started thinking that perhaps I'm asking the wrong question. Rather than ask what factors contributed to the near extinction of the crane, perhaps a better question is, what environmental, political, social and cultural factors protected the crane from near extinction in pre-war Japan? In his 1932 report, for example, Kuzu Seichi concluded, quote, if national measures are not taken to protect and preserve this valuable breeding ground, the red-crowned crane is likely to become extinct. He recommended halting proposed land developments and projects around the Kushida wetland, including the construction of levees and railways. I was actually surprised to find this evidence and I'm excited to continue searching the archives for more information. I'm also writing an article that ties together much of this research titled Crane Diplomacy, Auspicious Gifts of a Species on the Brink of Extinction, and I welcome any suggestions from the audience about where else I might find, uh, look for cranes in the archives or other strange places. Meanwhile, if you would like to learn more about post-war crane conservation, you can read my recent article published in Environmental History entitled Saving Red-Crowned Cranes, Children as Charismatic Conservationists in 1960s Japan. Finally, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the Japan Foundation for the, their generous support of my fellowship, to Sonoda-sensei for hosting me here at Tōbunken, and to um, Yoshimi-sensei for serving as commentator today. I'm thoroughly enjoying this precious opportunity to conduct research in Japan, and um, I'm excited about the next uh, continuing, continuing my research, and thank you for inviting me to share my findings with you today. ご覧の先生ありがとうございました。それでは次の発表者をご紹介いたします。それでは本日最後の発表となります。シェチュウエンさんを私の方からご紹介します。
資産は台湾で観光地として知られる沖縄に基地問題という一面があることを知り、沖縄及び米軍基地に長くご関心を持たれてきました。今回のフェローシップでは、基地問題で注目されがちな政治でしたり、歴史ではなく、基地周辺に住む地域住民と米軍基地との関係をどのように形成されてきたのか、彼らの交流から基地の文化がどのような変遷を遂げてきたのかを、文化人類学の観点から研究されています。資産は基地研究の多くが沖縄をテーマにしていることだから、沖縄だけでなく、本土の基地に視野を広げ、現在横須賀基地の周辺に住み研究を行っているそうです。では、瀬さん、どうぞよろしくお願いいたします。Thanks for everyone still being awake.、Um, my topic is extraordinary ordinary life communities in meshed with U.S. military bases in Japan. And here are the topics I'm going to cover over the next seven to ten minutes. My research examines the daily life of people living next to U.S. military bases where they are experiencing extraordinary as ordinary and extraordinary, and extraordinary ordinary life, or if I may, extraordinary ordinary life. By extraordinary ordinary life, I am referring to a precarious condition in which local residents are subject to actions by non citizens where security and danger. Peace and war coexist. To be more specific, people who live next to the US bases,、uh, military bases feel they are safe because the military is there to protect them. But at the same time,、um, they also feel dangerous because the place they live might be targeted during the war because they host the military base and the violent crimes committed by soldiers. Therefore, seemingly contradictory experiences and events, such as crowd pleasing friendship events hosted by US bases, Kichi Kai Hobi, like you can, see,、uh, you can see the photo on the left side, and a long standing anti base protest, the photo on the, on the right side,、uh, are an ongoing part of American military imperialism throughout the world.、Um, so, what is the US military empire? Most US military bases are located in other countries' territories rather than in the US. Currently, the US maintains around 750 military bases in more than 80 countries and territories, having about 95% of the world's foreign bases, as you can see on the map. The number is too high, thus, it's described. The United States is too military bases as Heinz is to catch up. This, this vast network of US bases in the world is called as an empire, a military empire, a base empire. Because this empire is composed of a vast network of global military bases and armed forces from which the US can project power without the burden of direct colonization, it is also called as an informal empire. To better understand the life influenced by the US based empire, I built my research on the concepts of contact zone, empire is in the details, and, in, and imperial duress. That is to say, in addition to focus on the political, economic, macro level dimension, my research observes how the geographically and historically separated people. Come into contact with each other and build up relations, and interrogates how US military imperialism continuously in the making of extraordinary, ordinary life of the local. So, why Japan?、Um, among overseas US military bases, United States force, forces Japan. And its surroundings represent an exceptional case. Despite its official renunciation of war as sovereign right, Japan has hosted American military bases and materially supported American military operations since World War II.、Uh, please see the diagram.、Uh, with 120 active bases and More than 53,000 troops, it is home to more American bases and military personnel than any other country in the world besides the US. 
And also, the high density of US military bases in Japan is unevenly distributed. Almost 75% are in the outlying Okinawa Island, and the remaining 25% are dispersed across mainland Japan. Therefore, many research of US military bases in Japan have focused on Okinawa. Though Okinawa is also part of my research, however, my research focuses on Kanagawa, a prefecture with the second highest number of US military bases in Japan and is called Daini no Kichiken, as opposed to Okinawa with the most US military bases. Kanagawa offers unique advantages because, in so far, a critical discourse surrounding US military bases often refers to Okinawa as a model case. It is important to have research on mainland Japan and establish a record tracing how Japanese mainlanders and Okinawans mutually influence each other through social networks and power relationships. And I concentrate my research on Yokosuka, one of the cities of Kanakawa Prefecture, because it has the only home port for American aircraft carriers outside the US. It hosts the nuclear-powered aircraft carrier Ronan Reagan right now, uh, as you can see on the screen. Uh, now I'm talking about my research timeline. Uh, my project is built on my master's ethnographic research in Okinawa and the preliminary field research I have done at communities surrounding the US military bases in mainland Japan, such as Misawa, Atsuki, Yokota, etc. Furthermore, it comprises five months of research online with hands off mode while Japan closed its borders to all new foreign arrivals. I bet everybody just experienced that, yeah. <laughs> and thanks for the support from Japan Foundation. I am able to conduct my one-year uh, fieldwork research right now, uh, primarily in Kanagawa and with shorter stints in Okinawa. And here are my three major research questions. The first one, how is people's everyday life in communities surrounding the bases shaped in the process of interacting with US military on a daily basis? Second, how do local people build networks with other people and organizations across Japan and in other countries subject to American military intervention? And the third one, how are the base cultures, might be plural, in these communities generated and transformed by the dynamic of relations between the US military and local actors and making its influence in Japan? And here are my research methods. Uh, I mainly employ three methods, partic participant observation, ethnographic interviews, on-site archival research, and di a little bit digital research. And here are people I have collaborated with uh, and interviewed with, such as local residents, bar owners, activists, tourists, volunteers, local government officials, etc., and of course, US military personnel. Um, well, and I hope this picture on the right side give you some idea about how I, as an anthropologist, look like when I conducted my uh, field work. And here are activities and events that I have participated in and observed. So on the left side is the uh, friendship culture exchange events, re uh, related business with the US bases, and on the right side, it's like anti-base events. Okay. Then, the last part, the research difficulties that I'm facing. Well, as you can see, I'm often facing awkward moments, such as being teased and asked, are you a spy? Or if I tell you, I have to kill you, these kind of things. And when I ask too much questions in details or when my inform informants or collaborators feel I know too much about them. And second, as a Taiwanese, a third country national to conduct anthropological research of US military in Japan, it is easy to be doubted why I want to conduct this topic and the process to get onto base is way more troublesome than Japanese or American researchers. And the third one, uh, because my research cover both sides, anti and pro, 
and I don't hide it. Some of my informants either worry that I will leak the information that they tell me to the other side or try to ask me the information about the other side. Whew. Also, it is pretty hard to just observe as a scholar who is always keeping the distance with their study object. For instance, my informants uh, from different groups with different political ideologies want me up Wang me offer my political opinions on such as Taiwan Yu Jin Yongji, Do Omo Alemaska. And the last one, I bet everybody just have the same experience. The pandemic has met a lot of events I plan to visit and participate in be cancelled. Also, conducting interviews has been harder and harder comparing to the time before COVID. Therefore, I have to rely on archives or historical news a little bit more than I thought. However, asking archives from the U.S. base is not a very diff, uh, efficient process. I am looking forward to your comments and questions. Thank you so much. Thank you それでは次に東京大学の吉見俊也先生よりコメントをいただきたいと思います。よろしくお願いいたします。Thank you very much and thank you very much a very wonderful presentation. I really enjoy three presentation. So let me do the the uh, the basically uh, the, the some someone comment to one one by one.、Uh, I really want to do the three comment or question for each. So let me start、uh, the Hu Rei san,、uh, the presentation about the sound and music、uh, in Japanese、uh, modern literature.、Uh, so the, I, I think、uh, because the, you, you focus on、uh, from re, 19, and, sorry, 1890s to、uh, 1930s. So it's a very important moment because uh, uh, before that,、uh, because of the major restoration, the Japanese Uh, whole society pursued、uh, the modernization or civilization, Bumekaika. But after the 1890s, because Japan, after Japan China War, China Japan War or Russia Japan War,、uh, Japan became、uh, how to say, the Asian Empire. So the intellectual people. Uh, became more and more a little bit skeptical or a little bit critical against the Japanese、uh, current situation. So, the generation after 1880s and 1890s,、uh, who were born after 1880 and 1890s,、uh, uh, uh, more and more, how to say,、uh, became uh, a, a kind of, a, they, they have some kind of critical sentiment. Uh, uh, Toward the Japanese situation. So, that, that kind of the generation are interesting because, which include, of course,、uh, whom you talk about, Nagai Kahu, Tanizaki Juchire. Maybe I can add, for example, Akutaga Ryunosuke, who, who was born in 1892, and Miyaza Kenji in 1896. Or Hajiwara Sakutaro and some of the others. So, <coughs> so, so uh, the first thing is uh, uh, the, uh, the, your discussion is uh, how to say, uh, clearly、uh, related with the new generation, new Japanese new generation in Japanese intellectuals after the 1890s. So, the, the first point is uh, uh, about this. And the secondary, Uh, uh, I say、uh, it's interesting because you focus on the music, especially Edo music.、Uh, at the same time, but after the 1890s, especially after 900, how to say something like the soundscape in, in the city, especially in Tokyo, has changed. Because、uh, ordinary people, including the,、uh, the Nagai Kafu and the Tanizaki, and those, those people are surrounded by. Uh, many different t y p e of the sound, noise. For example, the mechanical sound, including the, the, the railway and tram and streetcar and,、uh, and factory sound and advertisement and military sound. 
So, so many different sounds emerged and expanded after 9,000. And of course, we need to include the sound from the radio station and the uh, gramophone and so on. So the soundscape in the city has changed drastically after 9,000. So, uh, so the, the typical case is Nagai Kahu because he hates uh, radio sound. He hates such kind of mechanical sound. So that is one of the reasons why he wants to pursue the Edo sound. So the relationship in the so-called the modern mechanical sound, including a radio, and uh, Edo sound, that kind of the, how to say, the relationship between these two, 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 two multi-rayed soundscape might be very interesting, especially early 20th century. And, and finally, uh, I, I think, uh, because uh, I, I, I completely agree with you that the, you discussed about the, a kind of the, uh, the, the, the construction of Edo by Japanese literature. Because uh, from, roughly speaking, from 19, sorry, 80, late 1860, 1868 to, uh, to late right 1880s, you cannot talk about Edo. You could not, because all the Edo things, the Bakufu thing, the Shogun thing, and every kind of the, uh, the Tokugawa thing was oppressed, directly oppressed, because uh, they, they were enemy, and Choteki. So, but after 1890s, the kind of the recovery of the Edo image and Edo taste and Edo things after 1890s. So in that, exactly in that moment, I think there's some kind of the process of the reconstruction of the Edo as the effect of the modernity. So, uh, so, so maybe the Edo after 1890s are uh, something different from the Edo before 1860, something new things. So what is that? So that, 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 uh, that, that is interesting. Let me move to uh, Professor uh, Jan Poland. I, I also, I, I was so impressed by your how say, fascinating talk about Crane. You love Crane. I, 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 I really understand. And uh, because the, 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 in, in this is the second panel, uh, the first speaker talks about cat, and uh, you talk about Crane. And so it's a very interesting because so many discussion is where we are doing so many discussion about animal and birds. Maybe. This trend is closely related with uh, our, uh, how to say it, uh, the cent our consciousness uh, towards uh, environmentalism and some kind of, the, because of the, the, the global environment and, uh, and current situation about the relationship between the human beings and animal and the nature, because we need to decent, uh, sorry, decentralize our uh, hu human beings in centralization. So, so crane, of course cat. Cat and the fox is, is very intimate animal for, for, for us, but crane too. Crane is, especially in early modern Edo people, crane is very intimate animal for ordinary Japanese people, I believe. For example, in Edo era, we ate crane, Edo Edo, Edo people, especially the shogun and high-rank people, the samurai, so, sometimes they enjoy to eat crane. Cranes, I don't know. I, I haven't eat, eat crane, so I don't know the taste of crane. <laughs> Maybe if I ate crane, you hate me. So, 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 so I do not, and I can't, and I, do not, I, I don't eat crane, but uh, Edo people eat crane, and... Uh, Eight grain, as uh, they did, and also so there's a ukiyo-e and meisho zue and uh, woodblock print, uh, print, many pictures. We 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 it's so many crane in the pictures, especially in Edo, and also we need to mention about the tsuru no ongaishi, tsuru nyobo. So it's a, the folklore is very important to understand the Japanese, uh, uh, Japanese uh, story, the popular narrative. So Crane is very, very major figure to understand 
uh, uh, the, 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 especially the primal down uh, everyday life and the people's consciousness. So very, very intimate animal. So, and, and secondly, uh, you, uh, how say, you discuss about the symbolism of the gray. I agree, it's very important. Uh, Japan airline, but not only Japan airline, but also so many Japanese uh, has an image are entangled uh, or, or involved. Uh, they, they implement the image of Korean. Korean has a strong symbolic image, especially in relation with the na Japanese nationalism. So na national image. So I, I think because uh, I, I don't know how Japanese uh, society tried to rescue the, 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 the Tanchozuru. Uh, the the grain, but I I, I wonder the, what is the relationship between the, this kind of the preservation uh, story uh, and uh, uh, national symbolism or some kind of symbolism or national in some sense nationalist symbolism of grain. So 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 this is second thing. Now finally, but more practically, after the 1960 and 1970. Uh, how to say, uh, uh, practically, the, the, uh, the rescue or preservation of the grain is supported by so many how say, environmental movement, I believe. Because the environmental movement after the 1970s and 1970s expanded. WWF or Nihon Yachio no Kai and, uh, and uh, Nihon Shizen Hoko Kyo Kai, and many environmentalists are very, very eager to, 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 to preserve the, the birds' environment. So another interesting story is maybe about Toki. Toki in Sado Island are now gradually increasing. The number of the Toki in Sado Islands are gradually increasing today. Almost extinct, but gradually increasing. So, so environmentalism and the symbolism and uh, how to say the, the, the intimate relationship between the animal and the human beings Every interesting story is maybe uh, are included with your research. So that, that's so interesting. So Professor Akagawa, uh, he declared to start the cat sociology. So you can do the crane sociology is also clearly possible. So let me go back. Uh, let, me <laughs> let me go to the final presentation. I, I share your interest closely at the, the, at the she, uh, Chiu Ensan. So, I, I clearly see your interest because I, uh, I, I wrote some, some article about uh, the U.S. military base and the cultural influence uh, from the U.S. military base. So I, I read, I'm a little bit familiar with the field. And so I, 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 and I, 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 in many things, point, I agree with you. So you pick up the Kanaga picture. Yeah, that's right, because interesting. Because so many people focus on Okinawa. Of course, Okinawa is so important to understand uh, modern Japan and post Japan. But at the same time, Kanagawa is, 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 is especially important, especially in relation with uh, 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 the U.S. military base, uh, not only about uh, Yokosuka, but also about Atsugi, Sagamihara, and Fujisawa, and some, and even Yokohama. So, uh, how to say, until now, Many of the research in the sociology and the cultural studies and communication studies and so on focus on the popular music. The, the influence of the military base, especially in Yokosuka and Okinawa, uh, Yokohama, in Kanaga Prefecture, from the US military base to everyday life, everyday Onya people, especially in the field of the popular music studies. So popular, in, the, in the field of the popular music studies, there are, there are relatively many, many articles about your topic. So, so you can include those kind of the music studies and popular music studies within your uh, research, this first thing. And the secondary, uh, how to say, the, the, the relationship between the US military base and ordinary people in Japan are, uh, how to say, uh, research, uh, how to say, in, in, in a re relatively long run, from 1994, late 1940 to 90, current research. So, so it was already started in 1950s. So one of the fascinating article uh, uh, about that point, that this issue, maybe was written by uh, Yoshiyuki Tsurumi, I believe. 
because Tsurumi Yoshiyuki wrote in the 1950s very, very interesting ethnographic research about the influence of the U.S. military base uh, towards the surrounding villages and people uh, uh, surrounding the U.S. military base. And very interesting point in his article is because he, he, this is ethnographic research, and he researched the relationship between the U.S. soldiers and uh, Japanese villagers and also Japanese prostitutes. So three things. And how to say, the Japanese, because uh, Japanese villagers never had to say, uh, uh, say, say mention about the, negatively mention about the U.S. soldiers. And they discriminate uh, the you, Japanese prostitute. So, so the, 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 because Tsurumi Yoshiyuki focused on the many complicated and contradictory relationship within Japanese society. Japanese society is not one. Very, very contradictory, how to say, the, 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 uh, 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 this, uh, 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 I can't wait, uh, 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 divided within the society. So that kind of the multi layered and complexity of the Japanese society is important. And finally, uh, let me, uh, this is final point, point in, my, in my comment, because uh, I think we need to think about the continuity from Japanese military base to American military base to Japanese uh, 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 Japanese, uh, for example, the public park and sports stadium and so on, and the Olympic park too. Because uh, many of the US military base had been Japanese military base, in case of the Yokosuka, because Yokosuka was the, one of the most important Japanese Navy base until 1945. And Japanese military base, Navy base, changed to American Navy base. In other cases, Japanese military field changed to the American military field and American camp. So that, that is because in East Asia, uh, the Japanese military empire until 1945 was taken over by American so-called military empire. So there is a continuous relationship. That is a key to understand the American hegemony, especially in East Asia. This is, thank you very much, and uh, I, I talk too much, sorry. Yoshimi Sensei, arigatou gozaimashita. Sore dewa, sakihodo hapyo o itadaita san men no kata kara mo komento o chowdai dekireba to omoimasu. Yoshimi Sensei, thank you so much for your wonderful um, comments and questions. Um, I would like to address your second question first and go back to your first and third question, if that is okay with you. So your second question is about, um, so to answer your second question, uh, your so your second question is about this kind of um, contrast between the modern tech, the modern industrial and uh, Yes, sound versus this kind of pure and pristine adult sound. To answer that, I would like to um, bring up an example in my chapter that I talk about, which is Nagai Kafu's Kakao Nuta. And the, the text is about how the protagonist, like he was taking a street car and um, from the from Yosia area and to the Fukagawa area where he was hanging out with his geisha during his younger years. And he heard this kind of pure and clear sound of the um, of the adult music. And he, he heard two songs. And so like, a, there are like a huge contrast between all the modern noises and he heard during the trend, the human voices, the trend sound, the sound of the, the conductor, the sound outside, and the ugly, the ugliness of the modern advertisement versus the pure and beautiful pristine things he saw in he sees in Fukagawa. But like in my argument, what I'm saying, what I'm arguing is this is Kafu's recreation. So I read the whole thing as Kafu's uh recreation of all the modern sounds. I read the thing is Kakao Nota to me is like um symphony kind of written in the text form. So he reorganized all the modern sounds. Oh they're uh, well they're not pleasant. 
However, they stimulate his um, uh, non -dake. His this inspires him and stimulates his artistic creation, so that he reworks those modern sounds and and make a kind of chaotic symphony. That's a word he uses in the text, and make that and makes the train goes make his journey goes uh, goes smoothly from the modern, from the western part of the city to the eastern part of the city. It's a symbolic to the, from the west to the east. Um, well, like there are many people saying that, well, this adult that he longs for is a kind of an adult of the past, but like what I'm seeing is he sees a, con there's a like continuation in the text. All the sounds are reworked, adapted, organized. He's like a conductor of an opera. So he did all of that um, because this kind of idol that he is longing for is can only be recreated and, and reimagined in the protagonist's mind in the modern world. So this modern industrial sounds, I totally agree with you. And Kafir wrote so much about it. This Kanyanoto, he says he hates radio. And yeah, at the same time, I feel that the really, I feel like this strong emotion is his way of is something that inspires him to create artwork. And in a way that um, in Kafu there is a sense of melancholy, or like this kind of sense of melancholic operas all over his work. So he talks about adult music. So I kind of read this kind of aura of melancholy as a way of him expressing his some kind of criticism and dissatisfactions about what he sees in the modern world, especially the modern industrial sound. Well, the, the sounds of the factory, which he talks about in Sumnagawa. And um, at the same time, yeah, at the same time, he's reworking those sounds to make them his own. And I think, yes. Yeah, so I think that's very important. Okay, so go back to your first and third question. Um, I yeah, this is I, yeah, I choose this group of authors precisely because they are not the first generation authors that has that connections with Edo. So that Edo becomes something that can be orient that's an orientalizing like um, orientalized past that they can long for, and that's precisely the reason why I do that. Of course, the first generation they has so many issues with the Edo. Okay, and to make it short, um, yes, to make it short, so I see them. This the their rediscovery of Edo is not really a kind of rediscovery, but like a recreation of an aesthetic past through music, through the writing of music, and the music they are using is the music from the Yuling from the pleasure quarter, and they are talking about pleasure quarter women's love. In a way, in Edo or even in the Meiji and Taiyo period, those music they are not appropriate there. They are just bad songs for women and children. But those writers appropriate these kind of songs. So I think there is like a political message hidden, concealed within their references. And this goes to my second project I'm working on is how about how writers reimagining pre-modern China in their own um, fictional writing. So I was going to talk about Akutaka and Lulu's again is recreation of the pre-modern Chinese tales. And I'm, I was going to talk about like I'm gonna talk about uh, Nakajima Tsuchi. So this is something I'm, this like the reimagination and recreation of the past is a theme that I'm continuing working and I hope, yeah, that I answered all your questions. Thank you. Uh, Yashimi Sensei, I I do love cranes so much. I'm glad I was able to convey my passion to you. I love cats too. Um, <laughs> I um, I was a farm girl, uh, grew up on a dairy farm, and living in Hong Kong uh, for the last 13 years. And when I it was always my dream to see the cranes in the wild in Hokkaido. And I cannot convey how magical the experience was to see the wild cranes in the snow in the fields of Hokkaido. It was truly one of my top life experiences. And um, it, when I was reading source material by Uenoyama, the artist, he described his account, and I, I really could understand what it was like reading his words from 1936. And he talked about how different it was to see the cranes in the zoo to compared to the cranes in the wild. There was no comparison. It was. And what I find with reading these historical materials with people describing their first-hand encounters with 
the crane in the wild. There's so much emotion in it. And if we look at the history over the, the, the 20th century, people's relationships with the crane, of course, in the early 20th century, most people's relationship with the crane was about imagination or about images or story or folk tales. So they didn't have these first-hand encounters with the crane. Many people did not know about the ecology of the crane or the habitat. They did not know that it was a threatened species. And this didn't really happen or evolve until the post-war period when there was more of an environmental awareness developing. But it was really the work of the local people, farmers who started feeding the hungry cranes um, when the cranes came to their fields looking for food in the winter, and children, school children, and that's what my article is, is focuses on school children who played really... Um, uh, really important effort in not only raising awareness of the crane and it, its um, endangered status, but also educating people. And there was a lot of media attention in the 1960s. Children were actually um, featured in NHK documentaries, media coverage, and these children from Akan Middle School and other primary schools played a very um, surprisingly important role in raising awareness of the crane across Japan. Um, and this was also a counterpoint, of course, Professor Avenal has written about the environmental pollution of the 1960s, and so these stories of children saving cranes was a very powerful, again, resonating with the um, imagery of the crane and how intimate it is related to um, Jap the Japanese identity. Um, in closing, I'll just say that ongoing efforts to protect the crane, even though it is now labelled as vulnerable, um, I think it's, we can still consider it as pretty an endangered species. And the challenge now is um, for uh, ornithologists and ecologists to disperse the crane throughout um, Hokkaido, so it's not concentrated in one area and feeding in these, relying on feeding. Um, so it's, it is an ongoing effort, but um, I hope that by raising awareness, people will continue to learn more about the crane in its natural environment. Thank you. あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あ
、えー、東,洋文献東洋文化研究所所長の高橋でございます、えー、本日はお集まりいただきありがとうございました、えーえー、本年5月ですね東文献は国際交流基金との協定書に相互にサインいたしまして JFGJS イニシアティブという授業名でアジアにおける日本研究の発展および日本におけるアジア研究の発展に資する優れた人材の育成を目標に掲げ基金と協力することになりました。当文献は今年の5月からあ4月にですね GAS グローバルエーシャン・スタディーズというプロジェクトを立ち上げておりましてこの JFGJS イニシアティブはその中での中核的プロジェクトというふうに位置づけられております日本のアジア研究を先導する当文献がアジアの日本研究を支援してくださっている国際交流基金と組むことによってできることは数多くあるというふうに思っております。本日の第一セッション「アジアの中の日本」はこの JFGJS イニシアティブのキックオフにふさわしいイベントだったというふうに思っております。えー、来たる7月28日はイランの日本研究者、えー、9月15日にはエジプトの、えー、日本研究者にそれ,それぞれの国の日本研究の事情をお話しいただくオンライン講義を計画しております、えー、今後とも、えー、JFGJS イニシアティブに、えー、関心を寄せていただくとともにその発展にご協力をいただきたく存じます最後にですねお土産を後ろの方にあるのかな用意してありますのでお帰りの際にお持ちいただければと存じます簡単ではございますがこれで私からの挨拶としていただき挨拶とさせていただきますありがとうございましたありがとうございましたこの後はホールの外の多目的スペースに移っていただき大変短い間20分ほどにはなるのですが皆様の間でぜひ交流を深めていただければと思いますホールはこれにて閉場いたしますのでお忘れ物がないか今一度ご確認の上退出をお願いいたしますまたお帰りの際には、えー、アンケートと名札のご返却をお願いいたしますアンケートにつきましては記入いただいた用紙を入り口の箱に入れていただくかもしくは多目的スペースに置いてあります QR コードからウェブ回答も可能ですのでぜひともご協力のほどよろしくお願いいたしますそれではホールの外にご移動をお願いいたしますありがとうございました